I mean, that's that that's a, definitely a special class, and, and uh, we, we're happy to have Professor Rifkin with all her expertise and all her questions here with us today. Uh, so um, Tony's here. Um, so everybody say uh, hello and welcome to, uh, to Tony Shannon, who uh, is also known as Ruben. So Tony, can you hear us? Well, he may be able to hear us, but we can't hear him yet. So let, let's let him hook up his uh, his equipment, his microphones and whatnot. Um, I thought that uh, we might start with, I'm, I'm basically going to ask him to just to explain a little bit of his background. Um, and um, I, you know, he was, he was, he's from Finland, where I'm from, that's, that's how I know him. Uh, but he grew up mostly in Sweden, in, uh, in Göteborg, a town that you guys know as Gothenburg. And um, I want to ask him about that because he was he was he was a big name guy artist over there too, but in a little bit different way. So I, I want to start there and and let him uh, explain a little bit uh, about that time. But uh, I hope everybody has one question, or you know, if if you don't, that's okay too. Tony, can you hear us? Are you with us? Earth to Tony. Oh dear. Not yet. We'll wait. Um, so I know it sometimes can be difficult to uh, get things set up. You know, he, he's he's not doing this on the daily like we are. You know, we're like old pros these days. You know, give us Zoom, give us WebEx, give us Blackboard, collaborate. Mm -hmm. We're right in there. Is he uh -huh. in America now? Where I mean, obviously he, you know him from here. So is he? Yeah, he's in New York. He's he's, he's a New Yorker, and um, um, hold on. Look, it's snowing again. Let's see. Uh, I hope everybody had a chance to um, check out the website and um, yeah it was really cool he's you know He's really, uh, in a funny way, he's very versatile, but at the same time, he's very consistent to his style and it's very recognizable. And what's cool also is you actually see him. You know, it's, he's not one of these elusive people who are, you know, we, we just kind of talk about in these, uh, you know, it's like seeing fairy dust somewhere, you know, like, oh, that artist. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can go to, the Antarctic and see his work. No, he's yeah. He's actually, actually, he was posing in a lot of his pictures as well. So I mean, it's obvious that he was the one that made them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, he'll be in a Starbucks. He'll be in stores that you go to. And next time you you see his, I mean, you'll definitely see his. You know, you recognize him when you when you see his stuff. And a lot of a lot of artists are not like that you know they're not as recognizable and his his stuff is very geometric so he, 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 he tell me are you with us hello hey. i like the delay on i like the delay on your uh, instrument there what is this <laughs> the space oh. man I, I oh, had a couple of different yeah. sessions going on with a look at him. different browsers. So sorry oh, okay. for technical difficulties. Oh no, no it's to be expected. It, My head didn't work. I, I just told him uh, I, I just told the group that uh, you know you you don't 
you don't do Zoom and WebEx and Blackboard on the daily basis, so you're probably not all set up. See, we we, we do this all the time. This is this is how we go to school these days. And yeah. in all honesty, it would be harder to get somebody like you to join us if we were having our typical face-to-face uh, you know, -face sessions. So this this doesn't really really uh, require as much of you. Uh, so anyway, so here uh, is uh, Tony Showman, which translates to seaman or or seafarer or a sailor. Sailor. And. Um, uh, it goes by uh, Ruben, which is awesome. And I would like to ask you the first question, if I may. And I hope you have some time. You know, we we have about an hour, or so, and uh, you, you don't have to uh, stick around for an hour. But if if you want to, you can. Um, so I want to ask you first. Uh, I know you spent most of your uh, childhood in uh, Gothenburg in uh, Göteborg in Sweden. Uh, so I want to ask you what kind of art were you doing there and uh, how did that lead you to uh, New York City? Um, well, there are no cops here. There's no cops here. <laughs> we're not going to bust you for anything. So, so just be blunt and honest. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's truly an honor. Um, I, I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. Uh, it's the first time I'm doing something like this. So uh, I haven't planned too much. I'm going to wing it and try and be present and have a nice chat after. Hey, if, if you like winging it, then you might think about being a teacher because that's what it's all about. You know, <laughs> all we do is wing it. Uh, all right. So. So I appreciate you just uh, coming in with a, you know, open mind and a, and a, you know, just kind of a free, um, freewheeling attitude. I don't really. I actually do have a couple questions in mind, but uh, so I, I wanted to first talk about though, your uh, your years in Gothenburg, how you get, how you got your chops, and and if if you want to also answer one of my questions, which is how much of what you do now. Did you learn in math class? I was actually known for being pretty bad at math in school. <laughs> I, I wanted to be good in math, but uh, I, I was good up until like seventh grade. So it's it's kind of ironic what I ended up doing. Uh, so, uh, I know I, I, I learned my own framework. I created my own framework when it comes to math, different set of rules because yeah, I, I kind of struggle with the traditional uh, way of math. I, I totally get that now. Um, I guess I guess what I wanted you to mention is um, you did a lot with graffiti growing up. So mm -hmm. how did that uh, going from that kind of uh, bootleg side of things to uh, to to now doing uh, big pieces uh, that you get to do, you know, with, with permission? How, how did that work out? I mean, for me, <laughs> everything started. <clears throat> As a nine-year-old kid, uh, I saw a movie called Beat Street. This is 1985. Uh, it's one of the first movies about graffiti. And it's a fictional movie. It's not a documentary. But uh, I still remember that day vividly. It made a lifelong impact on me, good or bad. Uh, not not, e not easy as a kid because graffiti in its original form, first of all, is illegal because you it's about going to paint on the street or a subway car without permission. But that's that's not really what's relevant here. It's 
what's common with me as a nine-year-old kid in Sweden and the kids here in New York, up in the Bronx, who invented uh, the art for me is that it was kind of my only way to express myself creatively. Like we, I wanted to paint, and us kids growing up in this housing area, we didn't really have any other options. We we borrowed some supplies from school, or uh, kind of uh, we call it racking. Went to a store. We 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 didn't have money, so we we got supplies we needed and. Uh, but like with graffiti, everything gets drawn under the same line very often. There's good and bad, like when it comes to everything. And for me, it was very serious from day one. It was a way to express uh, my creativity. And graffiti, I still haven't figured out why graffiti and it's still what I do to this day. It has its origins in those graffitis. First and foremost, it's original about letters. It's about tweaking letters. My work may be abstract now, but it has its origins in those letters I used to spend so much time tweaking. Uh, we can discuss more what that means, but. Uh, yeah, so, and it, it's also kind of ironic that I, I ended up in New York that uh, uh, where this art form was invented, even though technically there was a guy in Philly who was considered the first graffiti writer. Uh, we call them writers, not artists, because it's, you write your name. Tagging, right? Yeah, and Rubin used to be my, one of my street names, I began, I, I, Ruben came into the picture when I was 18 in 1994. Did you like, did you, uh, I've, I've got so many questions now. Uh, did you actually take on, you know, when you, when you come up with a tag name like that, uh, do you, do you take on an alter ego of sorts or do you just use it? Uh, so you're not signing Tony Sherman? Both. I mean, you find some letters more interesting and attractive. So it's all about coming up with a name with letters that you like. And also when you're younger, a name that sounds cool. And I've always had a hit love-hate relationship with Rubin because there's some letters I really like and there's some letters I just, I, I, I've never been able to make it work. Did you actually study calligraphy uh, or or did you, did you just kind of, you know, wing it from a, a very sort of intuitive uh, basis? Um, I have a very untrad untraditional way when it comes to everything uh, with art. Graffiti originally being one of the five elements within the hip hop culture. But for me, I, I, I had long hair and I was listening to uh, heavy metal, metal. And uh, I would say I drew inspiration from the logos of the band names like I made and Dio had kind of a calligraphy. So it's funny. I never thought about. I, I've never had this question before. So the the inspiration came from different sources. So I think that also played into that. What I did from the very beginning kind of didn't look like what the other guys did. I I did abstraction the whole technical and geometrical side has been there since some of the things i do now i i did my first attempts like in 91 as a 15 year old kid so uh, the inspiration came from other other sides that's very cool now 
I, I want to open the floor up to uh, questions from other uh, people here. And uh, I, I've got a few up in my bag, but uh, Sophia, you want to go first? Yeah, sure, I can go first. Um, hi, by the way, nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. Okay, so I looked at your website, you know, our professor also showed us some of your work as well. And I noticed that a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot, you know, had the same colors, same shapes and everything. So I was wondering if each piece is inspired by something specific or something different, even though they all have like similar traits or if they're all representative of something else, or if you just kind of, I don't know if copying is the right word, but if you take traits from others and incorporate them into new pieces, or if you have like a specific building process for each piece. Um, it's a good question. Thank you so much. And uh, you're right, pretty much all my work, whether it's a small studio piece or 10 story mural consists of, I kind of ha have my own graphic vocabulary. It's basically, you can narrow it down to four or five objects that uh, I use to build, create my I also have a background as a musician, so I, once again, very untraditional. I still think as a musician when I paint and sketch, and I call it composing. Yeah. And so, so yes, I kind of deal with the same objects and also the same thoughts. The work being abstract, still every color and shape tells a story, so there's a meaning behind every story. Nothing is random with what, what I do. And the stories, in most cases, it's it's a personal one. I Painting is my best way to ex express myself. I've never been particularly good at talking about things. I, I prefer to do it subtle, like I, it, it's my comfort zone. Sometimes I can explain, but also there is no right or wrong. A lot of times I ask people what they see, and in some cases they might be, I'm like, whoa, that makes sense. But to stick to your question, uh, uh, yeah, I, I like to keep it cohesive and make it create new, with every piece I do, I like the work, the work evolves in small steps, but using the palette is same thing. I've spent years refining the palette. Uh, so I use the same color palette, same objects, but try to challenge myself how to use those same building blocks. And once again, all those, every everything originates from those letters over time. They, they it wasn't planned, but a, a sort of the construction process started where I, I came to a point like I was, I was a kid in Sweden doing graffiti and I was like, you know, graffiti, I, I, I'm not from New York. I'm not from the Bronx. I need to find myself in graffiti. And I started removing everything that didn't feel like me. Over time, when, after I moved here, I learned to know a lot of the pioneers, and I learned that that arrow that I used to do, it was that guy who invented it. It's it's not mine. It, it has to go. So basically, when you look at my website and what you see now is what what's left of the graffiti I used to do after I removed everything. So um, yeah. But that that's really fascinating. You you kind of just saved everyone else out and, and just left yourself in there. And it is very unique. And you know, please don't yeah, change I it. Yeah, I like that a lot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's about being honest to what you do, honest expression, and it may not be appealing to everybody. Like graffiti, mostly being very vibrant and 
when I removed the colors, there wasn't much left at the end, but it felt like me. And I think that also at the end of the day speaks to people, not everybody, but honest expression. That's kind of what you see today. That's great. OK, Fiona is uh, next. Fiona, are you with us? Oh, there you are. You there we go. You. There you go. My mic yeah. was off. Oopsie daisy. Um, no so, two questions. One's really simple. One's, do you have a favorite shape? Like, is there something that you make that is your favorite, any kind of shape? And then also, how? like, I know Sophia kind of talks about how you get inspired, but how do you just, like, conceptually take these shapes and put them onto a blank canvas to make these pieces of art. That's one thing that I've always struggled with with abstract stuff. Uh, thanks for the questions. Uh, the first question, circle. It's it's the most basic. It stands for so many things. Also, it's difficult. Uh, I paint freehand. You know, I don't mask. I don't tape. I don't project. Uh, I use some tools like what I learned in school not in math though I use like a compass to draw the circle then I hand paint so uh, yeah the circle and it's also very present it's present in one way or another in all my works and question number two uh, kind of relates back to what I started with about not being too good in math uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that I didn't want to plan too much for today, but I, I did think a little bit. And you guys being like pros, having a class in geometry and stuff, that's so cool. I wish I had something like that when I was a kid. But I was like, all right, I, I need to think a little bit. And your question is kind of what I was thinking about. When I, everything I do always starts with pencil and paper i'm kind of old school i try to learn like draw an ipad but i prefer pencil and paper and after done some thinking today what i do is it's it it's problem solving and there are rules but you can't apply the same rules what may work on one piece may not work on the other one so what dictates for me, I have my set of shapes, I have my palette, but it's all about what feels right. There's no, sometimes I do a pencil composition, a sketch, I'm super happy and I want to continue in the same style, but it doesn't work the next time. So it's like I have an inner compass that tells me when it's, it feels right if that makes any sense. So it's kind of problem solving with, I wish there was like a template I could use to know. So, but I, I, guess, I guess now we're into the territory of art. There's no rules, there's no right or wrong. Uh, we all have unique ways of thinking. It's like, just a quick musical reference, it's like, Keith Richards, Richards in Rolling Stones, if he takes a chord, if another guy takes the same chord, it's not going to sound the same. So I, I use basic shapes, but it's um, it's me. So uh, uh, I don't so know. Good, good luck replicating that, right? <laughs> just, <laughs> and, and the idea is, of course, not to replicate, but just to yeah. learn from. I, sometimes uh, I try so to you, you learn from Keith but you, you do your own thing. Yeah, and sometimes I try to basically sample myself, but it, it doesn't, nothing is never easy. Sometimes I try to find shortcuts, but uh, it doesn't work that way. And I, I, I guess that also relates back to an honest expression. If you try to cheat, even if it fits yourself, it's not going to work. So you, you catch yourself doing it. See, here it's it's me trying to catch these people. <laughs> yeah, but when nothing is easy, it, you, you got to put in the work. 
And the, the most simple work, I find it easier to go more detailed, complicated. So that's another thing when I create, I may have uh, initial thought of it's going to go in this direction, but I usually go in the other direction just to not keep it simple and do the most obvious. So that's super important. Yeah, you got to keep it fresh. Okay, Sophia Rothman uh, is next. Um, okay. Um, hi. I was wondering oh. if you took any specific steps in order to go from just doing graffiti to doing street art professionally. Um, I, I never dreamed of becoming a real artist. Nothing I've done has been planned. I didn't even think of becoming an artist because I thought it's, it's nothing. It's, it's, it's too, I'm not good enough. I don't have a formal art education. I studied guitar. <laughs> so, and I, I think that has also been, uh, I don't know if secret is the right word, because you make it very difficult for yourself in a way if you plan, like you set up, I mean, it's good, good to set up goals, but like, especially living in New York, where there's so much talent. So I think for me, it just kind of happen. I, I've always, always, one thing I've been very good at is work hard. Already when I was like a 10, 11, 12 year old kid doing graffiti, I painted more than the other guys. And just by doing something a lot, one thing leads to another. So when I moved to New York 12 years ago, yeah, I was, I painted, I, learn to know people. I found spots where you had permission to paint. You never know who you're going to meet, but it was more by, I didn't plan, but I was doing it a lot. And one thing led to another. I had never been painting in a studio. People saw me painting on streets. They took photos and they were like, we would be cool to own a piece. And I was like, I didn't even know if working in a studio was for me because painting graffiti, street art it's a very physical thing you paint big you use your whole body and then going to a studio uh, so I I eventually found a way to work also smaller and in a studio that was enjoyable for me so keep keeping it fun has always been the only thing I plan is I paint the way I think is fun when I was younger I also painted a lot like what how, what people expected that uh, I did commissions that I, I did figurative portraits logos that I didn't like so no I didn't plan everything has been kind of just happening and I try to follow along and just doing my best that's what it's about you always do your best and that that goes a long way yeah? of course uh, I wanted to be an artist but I it was it was too too far away. Uh, so um, yeah, yeah. I, I should. I don't think you should discount like uh, the 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 hard work and the talent. Uh, just you know, you just say you know you have you you had you know no expectations and you know you didn't dare to dream big and all that. But I mean, with the starting. Uh, talent that you had and then, then working harder than anybody you knew I mean that that that's what happened you know it wasn't some kind of coincidence that uh, now you're doing it for a living no and I came to a point I tried to do I mean doing graffiti I came to a point where I had to start taking some responsibility pay bills pay rent work and why I'm mentioning that is that I also eventually came to a point where I realized that we all are what we are and I came to a point where I finally accepted because growing up as a kid doing graffiti you, you grew up learning that what you do is bad 
grow up, cut your hair. Uh, so that also affected like art. I didn't think it was like a real job. But uh, then I realized that it is what I am. And I also painting was the only thing where I felt that I, I, I could like paint next to whoever, like playing music. I knew I can't be as good as Jimi Hendrix. Uh, no way. But with painting, I never felt that. I always felt like, uh, you know, I can, I can paint next to I like anyone I can paint bigger like so th there was that side of things uh. so a certain kind of confidence that that you know you, you you could take it to wherever you want to if you just work yeah bad self-confidence but still I, I knew somewhere like I, I always felt I and mean, it, it's, it's a nice feeling when you are, like accept what you are and you, you make something out of it instead of uh, you know wasting it away not easy though like there's I'm, I'm very grateful to be able to do this like for a living and I, 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 I never take a single day for granted I wake up feeling lucky every day so uh, I no, hope that, that, that that's I'm amazing. Understand. By the way, if, if you're wondering about what Tony's every day is like, you should uh, uh, become friends with him on Facebook. Uh, he's, he's on Facebook. You should look him up. Uh, Skyler, you had a question. Hey, Skyler, what's up? What you got? You might have to type it in the chat because uh, we're we're having a tough time with your uh, your connection. It, it's like it's like a delay. It's like a destroyer delay that just like squashes everything and like makes it into digital bits. I I couldn't hear a word you said. So can you maybe type it in? Looking at your shop on your website, love the titles. How do you title? Mm. Cool. Uh, <laughs> uh, great question. Nobody has ever asked me about the titles, and uh, um, yeah, a, a lot of references. Even though I don't have time to play music as much as I like to. But I still like to incorporate my music side of things, like I mentioned, I think, as a musician when I paint. And the titles, I need to listen to a certain type of music when I paint, which normally is not the type of music that I like. I like the Rolling Stones, uh, Rolling Stones t-shirt on me and stuff. but. Uh, I can't listen to any of that. I, I need to listen to specific type of music, and a lot of the titles comes from music songs, and uh, sometimes they're just re reflections of how I feel, what's going on. I like to be like a little bit subtle, but uh, not. Yeah, I like the work being abstract. It's not super obvious what I'm trying to say or do, uh, like make you think a little bit. But a lot of song titles, Google some of the titles, and you may find um, uh, YouTube videos of the songs uh, that I was listening to. Uh, so it's also a reference, like, yeah, what I was listening to at the time I created. Uh, the music is always in the background, and sometimes I'm like, hmm, there's something I can relate to. That makes sense. And uh, I usually have a working title. It may change a couple of times. So, and sometimes it, so whatever feels right. So music, songs. By the way, music is, is how we met. Uh, you know, we, 
you were born in Finland, but we didn't meet in Finland, right? No, um, we met in Dumbo. Uh, yeah, we met in Dumbo. <laughs> Dumbo and, uh, <laughs> and, and music is, is how we met and how we uh, originally connected and and played music. And then um, only later did I realize that we have this other connection uh, with the geometry and the art. Um, I, I want to ask you, you know, when you when you see your next canvas, um, how much of, and of course the canvas is not typically a rectangle. It's it's maybe nothing standard uh, about it. How much of the shapes and the colors, and it may be a different answer for shapes as it is for colors. How much of that comes from how you're feeling and and the environment? Let, let's say it's a big mural the buildings around it, how much do they influence your choice of colors? Uh, or maybe, like I saw the, the one piece in Miami, I, I feel like Miami's history of pastel had something to do with it. Uh, or maybe you saw a particular sunset and that gave you inspiration. So how much of, um, do you just feel it all out or do you have like a, like a standard sort of a way of working, like you look around at the neighboring buildings, you, you just try to mix it in. I mean, how do you use the same palette for every scene? Like how, so uh, please uh, enlighten us, you know, how, and, and, and again, it might be a different answer for the shapes that you use mm -hmm. as opposed to colors. No, absolutely. I mean, painting a mural in the public uh, even though I don't, I never compromise with what I do, but I certainly have a, have a responsibility uh, that what I do is super important. I spend a lot of time figuring out the right fit. Every mural has to be like, I mean, whatever the criteria criteria may be, like surrounding architecture or, or the history of the area. Like I try to be very respectful, like who live, is it a residential area? You know, there's people living and uh, what shouldn't I do? So there's a lot more that goes into it than uh, someone might think so. And then there's more obvious stuff. In the studio, it's more about how I'm feeling, but with the murals, also, yeah, the surrounding architecture. I try to do something that doesn't compete with other maybe beautiful things, buildings, but instead something that complements. And it's public space in a way, after I'm done, the work doesn't belong to me. So uh, sometimes it can be very obvious, like you mentioned, a piece in Miami maybe had more sunsets and pastels uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that it's i mentioned earlier i like to go the opposite way of what's most obvious too but definitely i do a lot of research i like to do like foot traffic i walk in the area yeah i do research online uh histories so uh yeah, nothing is random, and it's I it, also the right fit. I there's so many times I've seen a beautiful mural, but it's it's in the wrong place, and I'm like, what was they thinking? Of course, there's no right or wrong. I, who am I to judge? But I hope you understand what I mean, and that's that's a big responsibility of the artist to like what a waste of talent to paint a beautiful piece that just doesn't work so um, yeah there you go yeah, something like that might work in a different place um, uh, so Frank has a question uh, while you were in Miami did you visit Winwood walls the murals and graffiti are beautiful uh, yes I've been there uh, many times and I painted a lot in uh, the Winwood area I started going there just painting randomly on the streets. And then later on, I got invited to come and paint. Uh, 
so uh, yeah, it's first time was pretty overwhelming experience to visit Winwood, and uh, I never forget my first time seeing Winwood walls. This is almost ten years ago. I saw a lot of artists I look up looked up to, and um, uh, yeah. So uh, I, I hope to be able to go back when we're able to travel again. Then. One one thing is kind of nice for you is you didn't have to stop working. You know, you could you could keep making your art, um, which I've been witnessing uh, online. So uh, you, in fact, to get here on time, you had to you had to boogie your way up from uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and in fact, that leads me to my next question, which is, can you sort of break it down? Uh, you don't have to give us exact percentages, but. Uh, of course, I, I would appreciate that since you know I'm a big fan of percentages. But how much of your time is, you know, if you think of the whole span of of let's say a mural or or let's say you you're putting something up in a in a cafe, how much of your time is spent meeting with the clients? How much of your time is spent researching the whatever you need to research? And and then planning the thing, or you know, with pencil, paper, or whatever, and then actually making the thing. Uh, and then I'm assuming you have to clean up, or do you have somebody who comes and cleans up? Or so can can you talk about these different phases and how much of your time do they take? Uh, in ninety percent of the cases, I do everything by myself. Uh, sometimes people are surprised I don't have assistants. Uh, I've certainly tested the limits of how much one person can do uh, uh, because, yeah, all the logistics and it's it's hard physical labor. But breaking it down, I would say the, the painting part itself is usually the fastest and easiest part to get there is the majority of the work. And I would say uh, the painting part is maybe 25% of a project. Uh, communication meetings, sketches, renderings, uh, mixing the color palette, logistics, a lot of time, paperwork, you need uh, so, so much paperwork to get into a building and uh, uh, so uh, yeah, I would say 25%. When I get to the point where I can actually paint, the majority of work is done and it's like smooth sailing like when I finally reach that point so um, do you feel yeah. like it's all worth it going through all that red tape I, I hope so yeah but uh, it's uh, like the pro projects they've been growing like at the same time there's two two sides of the coin I like I'm, I'm very grateful and lucky to be doing what I love doing, but it, it gets harder and harder. And especially now, once again, I've been lucky during the pandemic to have work. And there's also safety aspect, like you're 10 stories up on, on a hanging scaffolding. It's no joke. You need to safety always first. And now with the pandemic, I have like double safety to worry about. So you really need, and you need to be in phys physical good shape. You need to be in mental good shape. Your your head can't be somewhere else when you're up on a scaffolding. Uh, you need to be two steps ahead, and that can be like mentally exhausting sometimes, because uh, sometimes it almost takes away from. The actual painting part, sometimes you have to compromise and you have to do that quicker and just know what you're doing because so much time went to other stuff. So 
not complaining, but yeah, it's it's a good question. And if people knew how much actually goes into, especially the the mural side of things, and I like going back and forth between studio and mural. If I spent three weeks outside in the cold doing a huge mural, it's nice to go to the studio, listen to music, drink coffee. Then you kind of get an itch again. It's nice to go and paint big. So, but uh, it's it's a lot to um, yeah. You 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 need to be on top of things all the time. So you you gotta prioritize it. Really well, I can tell you, it's uh, it, it's a, what you do is a dream for a lot of the people you're talking to right now. Um, we have uh, fine arts majors and design majors and all, all sorts of um, uh, visual people in visual fields, and uh, so just just enjoy the ride. Uh, and I I know you work hard for it. So we have a uh, let's take like two more questions. Uh, Lena has a question: How do you maintain a strong work ethic when you making your art? Uh, I just mentioned uh, priorities. I came to a point, like most part of my life, I play music and I painted side by side, and I thought I was always going to be able to do it. I still remember a good artist friend of mine from Chile. He told me uh, one night we were out having a beer. He told me, you're going to have to choose. And I was like, no way. But uh, I came to a point where I had to choose and you have to prioritize. And uh, yeah, it, it's really like to, today, I don't, like the weekend. I, I, I basically, I work seven days a week. That's what it takes, and Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, and sometimes you I'm have a kid now too. So that's I have a family too. I'm a dad too, and so once again, nothing comes easy, and I don't think it should. Then everybody will be doing it. But like today in my studio building, I I, I didn't see anyone else there. Yeah, my, my feet, I, I walk to my studio now because it's the only safe way I feel comfortable about. So it doesn't matter what day of the week. If, if, if I have work to do, a deadline is I do whatever it takes. If I'm like not feeling well, you, you, you get the work done no matter what. And you, you, you have to... Like the question was, how do you maintain a strong, a strong work ethic? You also have to mentally like motivate. It's not easy. Like so, you you just figure out ways to do whatever it takes. I wish there was an easy answer, but no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right, we'll just, 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 you know, I, I mentioned so much about hard work and blah, 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 but don't forget to have fun. Like I sometimes when it's too much, I remind myself like, you know, I may start doing something in a way that I don't, I'm not super comfortable with. I find my, I make sure I find my way back to having fun so you can do whatever like as if, if you love doing what you do so make sure you're in the right place in the first place like don't try and become an artist if you have any doubts or pressure from outside so uh, yeah. when you when your work doesn't really feel like work then you're probably doing the right thing and that's the thing for me too i can't believe i'm doing this for for a job you know <laughs> talking to people about art and math and just having a, a nice time doing um, it <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you, yeah, that's that goes for everybody. Now I think Yuteng was uh, just a little bit before Mateus. Um, so when I was painting, keep balance is the difficult part. The colors and the construction. Do you have any suggestion? Uh, yeah. So I mean, this probably goes to the core of uh, of what you do when you're planning. 
Yeah, I mean, you learn by doing wrong. Um, it's good to fail. Um, I keep, I tweak, I change. I like to improvise my colors. I always have a sketch. I don't think of colors normally until I start to paint. I don't like doing rendering. Sometimes for a mural commission, the client wants to see. I struggle working with colors, small screen on a computer. I like to wing it also <laughs> when it comes to color with my artwork. And I visualize, I start somewhere, and it's, it's a relationship with colors. Sometimes it works, it's effortless. Sometimes it's a struggle. I may change a shape 10 times. And it's really like I could have done four pieces since in the same amount of time I've been struggling with this one shape. So the balance is just once again until I, I feel it's right. And over time it has become more difficult because there's so much that goes into color, like not only the color, but temperature, the tint, the hue, and my inner compass, I'm almost annoyed because it, I keep refining nowadays it's that nobody would really see the difference on the last couple of tweaks that I did but it has to feel right for me so I, I just keep changing I, I have an idea in my head when, when I begin most of the time the work tend to have a life on their own and I try to go in that direction which is not necessarily the way I would like to go so uh, uh, and the colors and the sh composition the design of course they go hand in hand so they they have to work both and I do a lot of color tests and uh, um, yeah, I, I could talk a lot. Yeah, I noticed that some, of the, some of the pictures uh, that you have on your website, you have the color, the little um, little color squares on the wall. You're, you're probably looking at them uh, uh, and, and, and surveying the scene with those. Yeah, I make my own uh, color. I have, I have a whole flat file full of my own um, color tests. That's how I all... Also, if I travel somewhere, I bring them with me, and then I match. So, uh, do do uh, you have do you have yeah, like your own custom mixes that you get from some store, or do you buy like standard? Uh, standard good question. Stuff? So I have I haven't even thought about it now that you ask me. Like at Home Depot, I have. Uh, my custom mix is I take a photo of the label so I can go, they scan it so I can get the same color. Sherwin-Williams, I have certain stores where, where they, they save my custom mixes. So I can just go, I give them custom names. So I go to Sherwin-Williams if that's the closest place and I just tell them gray number five. Uh, and uh, so for the basic palette, I have systems worked out so I can be cohesive with the colors. Sometimes I just have to do uh, it from scratch myself. Uh, so uh, I become pretty good at mixing colors from, if I just have some color, I can usually make it uh, work. So. Uh, uh, well, you you know how to pick them. I can tell you that. Uh, Mateus, uh, this 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 will be last question. We got to let Tony uh, go for dinner and, and and everyone else. And so, Mateus, you got the last question. All right, cool. Um, I just wanted to um, know about the evolution of your work. I know you talked a little bit about how you started with graffiti and you started stripping that back. Um, so maybe just explain a little bit more of where you ended up and also if your work is still um, moving on is it you know is there still evolution in the work you're doing now do you see it going somewhere else 
uh, it's always easier to speak if you can illustrate it with like photos i maybe we have to do one we can, more we can, pull up, we can pull up a website if you want to uh the thing is that i haven't shared my old graffiti work i still keep my photo collection in a plastic bag uh, i've scanned a few photos i don't it's so uh i i don't really have it online i have some in my computer but uh, so to explain without showing fairly quickly um, having the work evolve is key for me uh, the day the work is not evolving uh, I will find something else to do for each piece I do I try to do something that's unique it's usually small steps but um, yeah I basically did graffiti until I moved to New York and I thought that here in New York I was going to continue doing graffiti but moving here discovering that yeah I, I'm from a totally different part of the world and it's when I moved here the unplanned deconstruction process started where, where I started removing everything from the graffiti, the letters, my Rubin pieces, all my pieces until I moved here used to say Rubin. Uh, this graffiti is very often, it's a rectangular wall space. You, you do your name in all these camouflage colors and shapes. But moving here, I started removing, like I said, stuff didn't feel like me. Also with like letters that the arrows had to go. And I also started growing up in Sweden, but I've always felt like my Finnish heritage is very strong. I always felt like a Finn. Moving here allowed me to discover my Finnish roots. And I started noticing that when I grew up, as a kid, you don't really pay attention to the glasses and uh, yeah, stuff at home. But we have very, had very traditional Finnish, like Itala glasses, Marimekko. My mom had a Marimekko dress. And those things had all affected me unconsciously. And I also started like reflecting of my, my Finnish heritage. So a lot of the clean Scandinavian aesthetics are probably in my DNA and it allowed me to also yeah being me and they they also came into the picture so if it makes any sense what I'm saying so that the evolution has been huge and uh, would be nice to illustrate do a photo slideshow. Uh, maybe we, want, you know, we'll do that uh, one of these days. Uh, you know, if you feel uh, like, or I can put it together and uh, send. Yeah, I, I, I could totally help you put it together too. Uh, uh, you know, just whatever uh, makes it easy. You know, we, I, I feel like we're already getting um, to to have like a real relationship with you, and if. If if you want to contribute anything more, it would be you know, totally uh, uh, willing partners. And uh, this this has been fantastic. Uh, I, I mean, th this is replacing my lecture on polygons, and uh, <laughs> those will be great too, you know. But we're just so fortunate that uh, you know you uh, you agreed to talk with us today. And uh, you know, th like I was saying before you logged in. Um, you know, for the third time, uh, that yours is is art that we see on the streets. You know, it, you're kind of like the 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 Rachenko of uh, of the New York uh, street art. Uh, you know, you you bring it to the masses, and uh, you um, you know your your art is viewed by millions. It, and it's it's really a, a 
it, it, it's it's probably a pretty sobering thought that you know it's not sitting in a collection of you know somebody's man cave, you know where one or a couple people will will look at it, uh, but you know people visit these uh, sites and uh, and and the stores where they are, and you know so you've got millions of pairs of eyes um, on, on your work and. And I, 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 for one, appreciate that you you think about that. You know, you you, you feel like you you have to do a responsible job, and and obviously that's part of why you get hired over and over, is because that's kind of felt by the community and and the the people pay the bills, is that you know, you you you're going to take the community into account. Uh, you don't just, you know, you you don't do a, a paint and run. If you will, uh, so that uh, you know, it's it's been a real pleasure uh, watching you evolve as an artist. Um, it, it'll be even more fantastic to be able to you know play you know guitars again and whatever instruments uh, we feel like bringing. Uh, but that'll that'll be in the future. But maybe even in a you know a more near future, uh, we'll we'll have you back and talk talk a little more about uh, the evolution of an artist. Uh, that that would be fantastic. So sure. um, maybe uh, you know if you have any parting words, um, the, that that would be great. Uh, and um, as far as the the class, uh, we're going to meet on Thursday, and it's going to be great fun too. I I don't want to hype it up and say it'll be even more fun than this, but it'll be fun to talk about polygons and tilings. And we're going at MC Escher. Which uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll uh, appreciate. Uh, so anyway, Tony, if you have any parting words, any uh, any grand wisdom, or or just just a buy. Yeah, can I can I join the class? Yes, <laughs> yes. You, yeah, you you got my number. All no, right, so super fun to talk with uh, like-minded people and. Uh, you know, I spend so much doing what I do. So if there's anything you you know I can do do to help to inspire uh, uh, other talented people, uh, I'd be more than happy to do it. So it, it's it's really been an honor, and thank you so much for uh, listening. And um, I really appreciate it. And uh, good luck. And uh, I'd love to show some of the evolutions. So thanks for the question again, Mateos. Next, I. Hopefully you'll get to see a little bit more about the evolution. That's that that's fantastic, and I'm I'm glad I got the uh, occasion recorded, uh, and so we'll have uh, you know a document of it, your your first one. So, uh, anyways, thank you, Tony. Thank you, everybody. Um, I will see you on Thursday. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.